It's absolutely wonderful to see you with us here today at our affiliated session at the United Nations uh, Food Systems Pre-Summit. Um, just making sure you're in the right place. This session is the Consumer Voices for the Future of Food, um, and we'll be talking about consumer advocacy's perspectives on uh, food systems and a joint statement that we have been working on together. This session is um, really exciting because of a number of things, but let's just pick out two. First, uh, it's a global uh, panel. We have representatives here from five countries who will be talking about a, a consumer statement. Uh, we are joined from Peru very early in the morning, um, from India, uh, from Zimbabwe, from the UK and from Korea. So my gratitude to our panelists who I'll introduce in a second. It's also an exciting session because we're hearing the perspective of consumer advocates, people who are consistently thinking about the experience, the rights and the responsibilities of us as actors in the marketplace, what we experience when we go and buy a product or a service. And how do we make sure that that is fit for the future? How do we make sure that all of us have the affordability, the choice, the safety, the redress that we're looking for in the marketplace? Um, I think it's also fantastic because um, these are part of the group that have been working over the past weeks and months to put together a joint statement from consumer advocacy of what we would like to see from the United Nations Food Summit and the heads of state who will be meeting to talk about the future of food. What do we think are the core calls for action uh, that must be on the table? And we are delighted to talk to and connect with anybody keen to work with us to advance those calls for action. So let me introduce first our panelists. We have Rose Mpofu, uh, who is the executive director from the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe. Hello, Rose. Hello, Helena. Hello, everybody. Wonderful to have you with us. We have Yu Kyung Hu, who is the executive director of Consumers Korea. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. A warm welcome. We have Ashim Sanyal, who is the chief operating officer from Consumer Voice in India. A big hello to everybody. Thank you for joining in. Elizabeth Iberico hails from ASPEC in Peru. She is a member of our Next Generation Leaders Network. Thanks, Elena. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good night. And Sue Davis is head of consumer rights and food policy in which at which in the UK. Hello, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. As I mentioned, over the past weeks, a group of consumer advocates have worked hard to put together the core elements of what we feel are particularly important in a call for action at the United Nations Food System Summit. There are five areas which are particularly important. You can see them here on the slide. For those who are not able to see uh, the slide, they are access to food, food safety, healthy and sustainable food in, in environments, fair and sustainable food environments, and consumer information. And for each of those areas, we identified three core uh, sub-pillars which must be uh, addressed in partnership. What we'll hear next is each of our panelists talk to uh, one of the pillars that they feel is particularly important, why it's important in their country, why it's important for a global conversation and what we should do next. So with that, I'd like Rose, if you could uh, join us first to speak in your words, in your mind, the importance of the first of those areas, access to food. Over to you. Thank you very much, Helena. Access to food leads to global peace. And as um, Consumers International, we urge all governments and development partners to ensure access to safe and nutritious food for all. 
food consumption patterns are mostly influenced by food pricing and quantity. Food availability and affordability must be guaranteed. Consumers must be able to pay for a fair price for food without sacrificing their right to a healthy diet. Consumers purchasing power needs to be strengthened, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. Various social protection measures, such as cash transfers, can be employed. Healthy food choices are basically more expensive than fast food, and this has caused the shift of food consumption patterns towards unhealthy food choices. In Zimbabwe, for example, the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe discovered through the dialogue to the United Nations Food Systems Summit that many people resort to foods that are too high in starch, sugar, and salt because they are the most affordable, but then they can lead to non-communicable diseases. We call upon governments to embark on nutrition sensitive agricultural approaches and promote massive production of the small grains as they are the nutritious and healthy option. Massive production of the healthy food will lower the prices as it will balance out the demand and supply issues. There is need to invest in technologies that enable the production of the nutritious food such as solar power grids, efficient transport networks, among others, for the ease of distribution of food, especially the fresh produce. This is that Consumer Council of Zimbabwe, being a member of the Food Fortification Task Force in Zimbabwe, there was a, a micronutrient survey that was carried out a few years ago, and the survey revealed that consumers were deficient in iron, zinc, folate, and hence government has made it mandatory for suppliers of maize, meal, cooking oil, wheat, flour, and sugar to fortify with iron, zinc, folate, and others. However, consumer knowledge is still lacking. People don't know much about the importance of the fortification program, and there is need for aggressive consumer education and awareness so that they can begin to demand access to food that is nutritious, because we cannot just talk about access without talking about the nutrition and healthy aspects. There is lack of information about food handling and standards, and consumers should be educated on food safety standards. There's also need for the proper standardization of the food vending sector so that food safety is achieved in that area, because it is more accessible for consumers. It is more affordable for consumers, but you find that in Africa, the street food vending sector is still lagging behind on food safety issues. And sometimes it is responsible or rather it brings about diseases such as cholera, typhoid, among others. Hence there is an ending cat and mouse fight between local authorities and street food vendors. We call for dialogue between local authorities, between government and street food vendors for education for consumers so that they can access affordable food that is healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rose. And I love the way you didn't just focus on access to food, you touched on how that interlinks to many other parts of the consumer statement, including consumer information, um, including food safety, and then of course the way in which that's underpinned by uh, governance by, and by authorities working together. If I could come to you, Yu Kyung, um, you have the topic within this interlinked uh, group of food safety. What does that mean to you? Why do you think it's important to have within this particular statement? And what do you think should happen next? Thank Helena and Consumers International for creating the opportunity to keep the consumer's voice heard for the future of food. So I hope we can all agree that consumers deserve a right to safe food. In Korea, we've seen food safety standards um, significantly improve during the past decades, thanks to consumer advocates working with the governments. However, we now see new problems in areas where traditional food safety meets emerging technologies in 
um, the more developed nations. Particularly in 2020, during the pandemic, and even now, we see more consumers buying food online. We're buying groceries, cook food, and meal kits through e-commerce and third-party food delivery apps. However, we, we find that the traditional food safety, disclosure, and nutrition label regulations are ineffective on these e-commerce platforms. Consumers also have far fewer healthy and sustainable options when the food value chain goes online. Consumers cannot observe the freshness of the food products for themselves. Consumers want to know the origin of all the ingredients and the nutrition information, and of course, if the safety requirements are met. They need more visible and more accessible information when using these mobile or e-commerce platforms. Consumers are also very concerned about the material and the amount of food packaging in the value chain in general, and especially when it concerns e-commerce. We all know that enormous amounts of food packaging eventually becomes trash and with substantial environmental impacts. E-commerce also brings new challenges to time-honored food safety regulations. Local restaurants that never delivered food before the pandemic started food deliveries. Consumers placed orders on third-party apps and not necessarily directly from the restaurants. As a result, we saw that food safety and disclosure regulations that were originally meant for in-person transactions at the stores or restaurants quickly becoming outdated and unenforceable in the new mobile or third-party based business models. Lacking the information and with fewer options, consumers are losing their power to make safe, healthy, and sustainable decisions that can transform the marketplace. In this time of profound change where the global food systems are strained and challenged by climate change and the pandemic, and where the online food marketplace is evolving exponentially, it is crucial to empower consumers to build a more safe and sustainable food system. We call on the governments at the food summit to be more agile and proactively tackle emerging food safety threats, especially in the digital environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yukyun. And I love the way you showed that these topics are, have been with us for decades, but now have a different flavor because of uh, the online marketplace. And sometimes the online marketplace means we need a, uh, a refreshed look at how we deliver on food safety and all of the other elements within our statement. Thank you. Now, if we could go to Ashim, uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, why you felt that uh, the healthy food environment was particularly important uh, to bring up on this statement, uh, what it means for you at Consumer Voice and um, what you would like to see from, from the pre-summit and summit. Thank you, Elena, for giving the opportunity. In fact, I'll begin uh, with a decade old uh, FAO statement. In fact, that's clearly stated that poor diets are a major contributory factor to the rising uh, prevalence of malnutrition in all its forms. Moreover, unhealthy diets and malnutrition are among the top 10 <clears throat> risk factors uh, contributing to the global burden of diseases. Incidentally, this has been now become top five. So we have not progressed positively, we have progressed negatively, in fact. Coming to the sustainable and healthy uh, food systems, in fact, it is important for us to understand what is it that we understand from, from this particular thing, in fact. So a uh, sustainable food system and healthy food system is one that provides healthy food to meet the current food needs of the generation while maintaining the healthy ecosystem that can also provide healthy and sustainable food for generations to come with minimal negative impact to the environment. So the environmental factor plays a very crucial role both for consumers and for producers in fact. So when I say healthy and sustainable uh, food system, what does it mean to a uh, for a common understanding, in fact. This includes actually optimizing agri-land use. You don't cut forests to create uh, farmlands. As an example, reduction of pesticides and insecticides in uh, foods uh, and crops, 
uh, which invariably uh, lands up on your dinner table or di I mean dining table. I mean, there's no way that you can eliminate them. Uh, importantly, improve food supply chains from farm to fork. And this is very, very important for a devel developing nation like India, where this is being developed at a very slow pace. So which means we hardly have access to farm fresh foods. Uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, there are, uh, I mean, intruders in terms of, you know, a lack of uh, cold storages, etc., which add up to the worry. Shift to more sustainable diet patterns, in fact, and this is the consumer roles. So unless the consumer determines what is more sustainable for him as a dietary balance, in fact, no one can help the consumers, in fact. So it's a knowledge gaining exercise that we want consumers to have in terms of what is a sustainable diet and time permits i'll come to that also reduction of unhealthy consumption of processed and ultra processed foods as we all know things have changed in the past one decades we are now basically in the world of fast foods in the world of uh, snacks in the world of uh, junk foods so basically we are talking of high sugar salt and fats saturated fats in the foods which is we all know are very harmful for NCDs, in fact, and importantly, FOPL labeling of unhealthy foods as consumer choices. Now, consumer choices are the, of least worry to the producers, but we must bring this up front, in fact, during this pre-summit and summit that we have a right to choose. And so provide us with foods that basically we can identify as healthy foods, in fact. So if you look at the food environmental which are sustainable in relationship to the public health policy that exists. We must basically look at junk food, unhealthy foods, high food that basically require measures, regulatory measures as we are doing so in terms of advocacy in India. We are basically advocating for a lot of uh, things that the consumer have as daily diet which should be marked as healthy or unhealthy in fact it is also to do with high prevalence of uh, ncds uh, that india or any developing nations has in fact so i'll conclude by saying that it is important for a developing nation to build in systems that's exactly what we are doing in india we are basically looking at the global perspective we are looking at our local markets and we are looking at the consumer needs in fact trying to match all three to come to a conclusion what is best for India. Consumer voice is acted and probably in the next one decade, we will transform uh, the ecosystem of healthy foods. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. And for explaining that essentially the main barrier to consumers uh, up taking up a healthier and sustainable diet is the marketplace barriers as opposed to the consumer interest. And we need to, to address those barriers. Can I come to you, Elizabeth, now? Tell us what you interpret as a fair and sustainable uh, food system for us, and perhaps share a little bit about um, perspectives from the Next Generation Network as well on this topic. Thanks, Elena and Consumers International for the opportunity to be part of this. I'm delighted to can share some ideas about this topic. Well, in first place, I I think it's important to highlight the talks about fair and sustainable food system. It is strongly connected. And also like many of my partners say, with all of the topics, with uh, access to food, with health environment, with consumers international, with all the topics, it's necessary to connect them. The, I think it's a mistake when we try to separate healthy and sustainable. There are interrelated, and this world makes a difference if we want to ensure health and food security for the next generation. Sadly, from a spec, for example, we see how in Latin America many governments and also companies doesn't take enough attention to this topic. We think that they, uh, that they think that this is an extra characteristic, but it's not necessary. And the consequence we can see now, for example, in Peru, there are many zones with a huge natural and cultural patrimony that are becoming extinct. And also many of, uh, many of the native species that are there with an important nutritional value. 
So I think it's this is important to take note. And in this context, many of the consumers organization for many years are become are leading campaigns in order to take out to make aware to consumers to when that when they take a decision for buy a food, for example, they don't not only take a decision with health characteristics. They, we are making many campaigns in order that they consider also sustainable aspects. And we have results now. For example, there are many quality studies in Peru that, make, that show us that many consumers that buy in buying markets and also considering aspects that ask, for example, to support local farmers, uh, products with zero pesticides, or products that are natural and becomes from our ecology. So that is a shame, but we think it's not enough. And at this point, we need the support and also the attention of the government. Therefore, I would like to finalize saying some of the some policies that I think is necessary if we want to achieve a big impact. And the first one is the traceability and transparency about the provenance of food products. Second one, and I think it's really important to give information to consumers in the food level related with the use of GMO, with the use of pesticides, or with, or with the impact that have the, prov the product in the environmental impact. Also, if necessary, economic strategies to promote sustainable products and the work of our ecology farmers. And finally, it's, I think it's important to create spaces where consumers and farmers can connect and in these spaces we, sh we, sh we should promote a healthy and also sustainable product. Thanks Elena. Thank you so much Elizabeth. I really like that sort of let's put these things together, uh, health and sustainability. And I want to point out also that one of the uh, common areas that the consumer advocates working on this statement felt was important is investing in infrastructure to reduce food waste and loss, um, which I think comes through uh, very nicely in what you're saying too. Now, to round this off, um, a, an interlinked and very broad uh, conversation, um, we know that information alone cannot solve this, but it is incredibly important. Um, and so, Sue, could you speak a little bit to uh, the importance of information how you believe it could be reimagined. And please then feel free uh, to share your thoughts across, you know, how that links to other points on the consumer statement as well. Thank you very much, Helena, and hello everyone. As you said, consumer information is really crucial for people to be able to make informed choices, but information alone isn't going to help. It needs to be within that wider context of making sure that you've got healthy and sustainable choices and affordable choices that people can make. Um, I think we also need to think about consumer information in the broadest sense. Labelling on packaging is always going to be crucial. Many people will shop in store, but as we've already heard, things have changed a lot in the pandemic and people are increasingly shopping online, people are eating out of home, and so it's important to make sure that people have the information that they need to make those choices in those settings as well. Consumer information can go incredibly broad and basically consumers have a right to understand what they're buying and eating and people may want information about particular production methods, food safety information is obviously absolutely crucial, information about allergens, information about origin. But I particularly wanted to focus on the information in order to make sure that people are able to choose healthier and more sustainable choices. Um, I think the first issue and one that's highlighted in the statement is about having real clarity about what people should be eating to be healthy and sustainable. And as Elizabeth set out, we can't separate those, but in the way that it's often dealt with in a policy sense, you may have nutritional guidelines, but we don't necessarily have guidelines about what people should be eating to be sustainable. This is something that's really important and where governments need to take a lead. Um, but also where we can draw on international best practice as well. Um, it's also important to make sure that there aren't commercial interests that are influencing that. People need to have evidence based on independent scientific evidence to be able to make informed choices. And sometimes that means that difficult um, truths have to be um, 
highlighted, for example, the importance of reducing foods that are high in fat, sugar and salt, shifting to alternatives, but also the shift um, to more plant-based foods away from meat and dairy foods, which is going to be really important going forwards. The second issue I wanted to highlight closely related to that is about labelling and consumer information that makes enables people to make choices about particular products. In the UK, we have strongly supported the Traffic Light Nutrition Labelling Scheme. Other types of simplified labelling schemes have developed in different countries, many using colour coding or using warnings. Um, it's really important that those schemes are supported by government, underpinned by independent evidence, and help to put that and those national guidelines into the context of individual products. Where there's a real gap is about how we then move forward to look at the environmental impact of food and a real opportunity because we know that people want to make those types of choices, but it can be very difficult. So developing indicators and developing guidelines for labelling that will help people to lower their impact, whether that is about carbon or water, biodiversity or other elements of sustainability that are important to people. Um, and that also needs to be government led. And we need to avoid having a proliferation of different schemes that will cause potentially consumer confusion if they're looking at different schemes on, on different products. And then the third area I wanted to highlight was the importance of tackling misleading claims, making sure that people have accurate information and they can trust what they see. So we need to have clear standards for health and nutrition claims, um, but also for increasingly for environmental claims that are included on products. And that includes things like recycling information and Consumers International recently did a big multi-country study which highlighted that the information can be very confusing on, on certain products as well. And then finally, I just wanted to emphasize that we need a policy framework that supports this as well. We've seen, for example, that some of the nutrition labeling schemes have been challenged um, within um, the committees at the WTO because they're being seen as a barrier to trade. But we have to move beyond that. We have to think about how trade and agriculture and wider policies can actually support consumers in making healthier and more sustainable choices. Thank you. Wonderful. I'd like to thank um, all of our panellists very sincerely for the support they've given in the run up to the pre-summit uh, in crafting this statement and for uh, sharing their passion for the topics within that here today. Um, for any of you on the Zoom call, uh, we put the statement into the chat and it's also up on uh, the Consumers International website. So it can be used, shared for feedback. Um, this is only the first step, of course, um, and a first step in this process, which is part of a decades long journey for so many consumer advocates. And I'd really love to hear the wisdom of this group on how do we go from this pre-summit to the summit where uh, heads of state will, for the first time, look at the food system and its importance. It's, a, it's quite a historic moment. Um, so I'd love to, to hear from each of you. Um, what are you doing with this statement? How are you using it? How do you think others could use it? What can we do um, to really get some of these points heard even more because we're working together? Um, Ashim, can I come to you first? Because I know you'd had some thoughts on this um, when we last spoke. Uh, I think the most important thing is that the pillars of so-called uh, uh, healthy food and sustainable food have been defined uh, in these statements. I think that they have been elaborated uh, they have been defined and they have been marked as important. So these five pillars, basically, we can take them as important uh, outcomes in terms of consumer advocacy uh, after a lot of deliberations were done by the task force, in fact. So it's important for us to take forward each of the statements for to the, not only the summit per se, but in the pre-summit discussions. It's important for us to, for example, if I talk of regulatory boundaries uh, of a developing nation like India, I always think of uh, the, the interference by the industry. In fact, they play a major, major role in terms of delaying tactics, in terms of diluting tactics, and in terms of basically uh, uh, reversing a trend which is uh, basically beneficial for the consumers. And they are hurt. 
Unfortunately, they are heard much more than consumer groups are heard, in fact. So and in advocacy, the, the greatest challenge, if somebody asks me ever, always I say, number one is the adversary, is the industry itself, in fact. It's not because they're here for philanthropy. I don't mean that way. I mean, they're most welcome to make as much of profit, but not at the cost of consumer health, is basically the, the, the buzzword that I always use in such di dialogues. So you make your profit out of basically the, the good product that you sell because we believe consumers will latch on to good products, healthy products in the near future. The regulators, therefore, in all these countries have a major, major role to play in terms of giving directions and listening to consumers. So my takeaway from this pre-summit is basically, will the consumers' voices be heard? That's, that is the statement that is being made. I want them to be heard because we are talking sense. We are talking logic. We are talking from a point of view of end consumers. I mean, basically who are consumers. I mean, after all, the produce, producers are also consumers. They, sh they should support us. So importantly, it's important for us to define the individual goals into a rough uh, diagrammatic uh, posture in terms of a uh, systems approach which the summit talks about of uh, basically a public summit in fact voices should be heard the regulatory framework should be discussed and the pre-summit and summit should actually give due importance to what the consumers are submitting consumers are saying and consumers are i mean basically telling uh, all the summit members and the member states uh, heads that we are here to cooperate with you, but give us a system which does the in-country uh, support systems uh, is willing to give a pillar of support to the consumers' voices, which are actually in terms of not only advocacy, but whenever we interact, we leave some advices behind. So importantly, the regulatory framework of developing nations, and I speak on behalf of India, needs to be strengthened, needs our consumer perspective. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Ashim. I know that there are multiple coalitions that are being built, um, which bring together a whole range of perspectives on key topics like school feeding, uh, like regenerative agriculture, like blue food. And I think it would be wonderful for consumer advocates to be involved in those to make sure that the consumer voice and perspective is, is brought to the fore. Of course, that means that we as consumer advocates also need to be open and ready to participate. Elizabeth, do you think, uh, do you think ASPEC and other uh, consumer advocates in Latin America and other next generation network uh, advocates may, might be ready to take part in that? Yes, and I completely agree with the position of Ashing. I think it's really necessary that the voice of consumers should be heard. And I, I just will add the voice of young consumers. I think it, the voice of young consumers are the ones who want to raise their voice and to take actions. And to take action by digital tools, as for example, uh, Facebook or Twitter or these kind of things, uh, we, uh, we see how the voice of consumers in many of the cases, and when we talk also in food system, about food system in Latin America, it's like a, it's not considered, but we are part of the food system. So why not, we, we, we should be heard. Sadly, in Peru, for example, consumers is not, consumers is not necessary in some of the in some of the tables, but we aspect, for example, is working for many years in order to raise our voice in order to uh, in order to protect our rights as consumers. So I think it's important, as say as Ashley say, that we have to hear the voice of consumers in this point. Perfect. Thank you. Yu Kyung, could I come to you? What, what is the um, way in which consumer advocates can play an important role uh, in these discussions? What innovation, what perspective can consumer advocates bring to the, to the conversation? What would you love to see happen um, in the next couple of months towards the summit? Um, so 
the Korean government has actually convened the opinion of um, from suppliers, from manufacturers um, in in preparation for the food summit. Um, we're, we're very um, happy that the government has included discussions from consumer organizations and we have been able to contri contribute and participate in the discussions. Um, but I think the, the pre-summit and Consumers International bringing this statement from the global perspective is very important because it is not just a local consumer organization. It is the global voice of all the consumers and we should be focusing on these very important areas. And um, the government is very um, keen to learn from other um, perspectives and jurisdictions too. So just from the Korean perspective, we've traditionally we've been working, um, Korean organizations have been working on food um, safety and nutrition issues, but more recently we've, we're working on sustainability issues. And in that regard, um, consumers themselves cannot change the whole, um, food system for to make it more sustainable. And it is very important to make our voice heard and for the government to take actions and work together with the whole food systems, all the other stakeholders in the system. Yes. Thank you. And could I call on uh, Sue and then Rose, your hopes for the time between the pre-summit and the summit, what would be the one thing that you would uh, look as an uh, look for as an outcome from uh, this particular statement in its entirety. I think it's the level of ambition that's so important that we can't lose this opportunity. We know that our food system is damaging our health, damaging our planet. We had a national food strategy published recently in the UK that makes that really clear and sets out the implications really starkly. We need to see governments coming together, and we need to see a joined up approach as well and that this isn't just about food departments or health departments or environmental departments it's about putting food right at the top of the political agenda and so that's what needs to happen I think up to the summit in order to build that momentum and have some really concrete um, outcomes from the summit that will drive national governments to be more proactive in tackling some of these challenges. Wonderful and do you think which um, how will which approach this in the UK? Well, we're inputting into the discussions at national level. I think one of the things that we can contribute is our understanding of what consumers see as the barriers, but also we work across lots of different government departments and we see sort of some of the, the mismatch between different approaches to policy. So it's putting the pressure on government um, to be taking a, a much more joined up approach. We're doing a lot of work, for example, on trade policy, and we see a lot of contradiction potentially in the way that um, we're developing our food policies, our agriculture policies and our trade policies, which need to all be aligned, focusing on tackling the same challenges if we're really going to shift and see the transition that's needed, which you know, is, is something that is now really urgent. Um, we're seeing um, the impact on our health through obesity. We're seeing the environmental damage that's being caused by our food system. And we know that consumers want action to tackle that. Thank you. Rose, we started with you. Uh, we started our journey through access to food, food safety, health, sustainability, information. Um, from your perspective, what would you like to see uh, from this uh, call, to, call to action in its entirety um, at the Food Summit, food summit and the pre-summit? Um, thank you very much, Helena. I would really want to see a lot of uh, information going out to consumers in the form of education and awareness. Because during the um, dialogue systems that we've been carrying out, that came out very clearly that consumers need more education and awareness for them to be able to demand for healthy food, particularly uh, in Zimbabwe, there is um, what are called the small grains, which are very nutritious. If you look at Rapoko, not many people would like to eat it because they believe it's, um, it's old fashioned, it's, um, it's not well processed. So there is need for government to, to invest in um, technologies that enable the farmers and processors to be able to process it in a very clean, standardized way so that consumers will be attracted to eat the small grains. 
which are very nutritious. So as consumer bodies, we really need to advocate for the education and for awareness. There is a, a big need for forging partnerships with fellow consumer organizations, but also with development partners and government so that we, we tackle this issue of information education together. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So I'm looking through, I'm seeing a lot of uh, comments and uh, uh, compliments to the panel um, from uh, participants and consumer advocates across the world. I think the best thing to do with the time we've got left is really to ask each of you, um, what would your key message be to uh, the consumer advocates who are listening to this panel? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what would you do with this statement? And what would you do uh, next to ensure that we reach a safe, fair and sustainable food system for all? Um, Elizabeth, let me start with you. Thanks, Elena. Well, this is a big issue to talk about food system. I just would like to finalize saying that it's necessary that all the consumers organization be part of this movement. And as Seiju Kyung, it's necessary a global voice and the global perspective of consumers in this point. There are many ideas about food system. There are many definitions about what is healthy strategy or what, what, what we, should, we have to do about food security. All the, um, all the countries have a local reality, but we have to join us and to have one voice in order to have an impact. I like that. Thank you so much. Um, Yukio, what would be your call to action to, to those who are on the call today? Um, well, first of all, I, we would need to translate the statement into our own languages, the first step. Um, we would reach out to as many um, consumers in our nations as possible through social media campaigns, consumer education, and so forth, and also bring the statements to our, the relevant government authorities to show that these are the global consumer concerns that we should all be concerned and focusing on. That's fantastic. We would love to see that, and we're very pleased to support any consumer advocacy organization uh, that wishes to do that. Uh, over the coming weeks. Rose, what would your call be to the group listening to you now? Thank you, Helena. There, there's need for us to use the various media channels, particularly government ministries, authorities, uh, the regulators, and also to work hand in hand with each other as consumer advocacy bodies so that we give the message loud and clear and when it comes to the final summit in, in September, all our countries will have gotten the message very clearly and they will be able to support us. Thank you. Wonderful, Sue. Thank you. I, mean, I think there's real strength in the statement in showing just how much common ground there is across, across consumer organizations from many different countries around the world. And although we, we've got different circumstances at national level, different policy context, we all need to work together to make sure that we're um, creating this shift, putting pressure on governments and businesses to make sure that they are shifting to more sustainable um, production methods, but also supporting consumers in making more healthy and sustainable choices. So I think there's real power when we come together in order to um, tackle some of these issues, particularly if we're often dealing with global markets um, and multinational companies that are operating in many countries and not always doing exactly the same thing. So I think we can do more together, but I think we also need to be using all of our advocacy skills at national level in order to get this up the agenda and make sure that our government is taking the opportunity from this summit seriously, but also really implementing things at a national level. Fantastic. I think it's um, an amazing opportunity. This network is really quite unique in its uh, reach uh, in the solidarity and in the fact that we then have um, roots uh, into some of the United Nations and global processes. So I would really encourage us to, to use those. Ashim, we're going to end with you. What would your call be to those who are listening to this uh, 
this uh, free summit um, session on consumer voices on the future of food. I think it's very important for us uh, to understand that it's taken a long journey, in fact, uh, to reach where we have reached at this platform in terms of pre-summit. A lot of hard work and advocacy <clears throat> strategies have to be developed basically so that we ensure that uh, in-country governments speak in the same language that uh, we are speaking. I think that's a very, very important two months period, in fact, that we have. Uh, there is uh, uh, a task force constituted by most of the countries, in fact, and uh, it is important that your voices also reach out through the statements prepared, in fact, and you do some presentations before the task force uh, that they carry the message uh, to Rome in terms of the September meet with very clear cut ideas that our consumers want this particular delivery to be ensured in the summit declarations. It needs not be a very detailed one. It can be short and abridged, but as long as it is mentioned as a summit declaration, I think it serves the purpose. So we have a rough road ahead in terms of convincing uh, a lot of people in ministerial, at the ministerial level and in the bureaucratic setup in the next two months in terms of messaging. Wonderful. Well, I think that's clear. Um, so thank you everybody for joining uh, this session where we heard uh, about a joint consumer statement on the future of food. You heard the importance of five key areas, which are of course interlinked, but are commonly felt to be incredibly important and of priority. You've heard the importance um, of those areas and of the statement to each of the panelists here who come from across the world. And you've heard their calls to action to consumer advocates everywhere with very practical next steps and a recognition that there is common ground, um, that we need to influence a range of stakeholders for this to happen, that we can support each other. Um, we're standing on the shoulders of giants who have been fighting these battles uh, before, and we know that there is a long journey together, but um, we have a fantastic group of people here, and I am so uh, grateful to those who've joined the panel here today to share their perspectives, to those who've been part of the task force uh, in the run-up to this pre-summit uh, for all of their dedication and hard work. I can see a couple of them uh, in the session here today, and um, I'd like to thank all of the consumer advocates uh, for their dedication and hard work to protect and support the rights of consumers everywhere. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, please do go and look at the consumer statement. Let us know how we can help you use that. Um, and uh, let's walk forward. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, moderating here today. We wish you a wonderful rest of the week and we hope to speak to soon. Stay safe, stay well.